Okay, cool. So the purpose of you know talking to you is for you to tell me all about you. Your artist name is Greater Alexander, That's right? Correct. Yeah, I mm -hmm. uh, checked out your website. Really, really love the music you make. So I'm not surprised you're making money from that music. Uh, you know, it's, um, I mean, I, personally, it's really my style. I love that style of music, but as well, you know, that's just kind of personal taste, but also the production quality is great. So, um, which is why I'm not surprised it's, um, you're successful with sync licensing. So um, why don't you, Tell me a little bit more about like how you started out. Like if you started music, learn learning an instrument when you were a kid, or if it came later. Um, you know, if you studied like accounting before you realized you wanted to go full time music. Like, kind of tell me a little bit about your journey. Yes. So, I guess my journey started. I guess as far as music goes, it was uh, almost like a traumatic upbringing. Um, okay. My father put me inside, uh, like my first instrument was essentially piano, but I had like a little mini Casio keyboard that I was trying to practice at home while being taught by a, um, basically uh, an aficionado of the piano. He was like a Polish, uh, Russian um, uh, master mind at his yeah. craft classical trained right. classically trained and um so every time i would go in there and it was around the age of 11 12 um he would really just put the metronome in front of me and give me all these rigorous tests and then if i was failing he'd be screaming at me so this was like kind of like my upbringing was also traumatic in that sense. So I was like, well, this is used to it. You know, you don't understand what shame is at that age really. And so here I am like trying to do my best for somebody that has already been in his prime and understands what it was. So I, I never knew what it was like for him as a 12 year old boy, but I imagine he got a similar lesson and here he was mirroring it to me and I wasn't achieving his way of seeing it. So I ended up stopping really fast. I actually never told my father until later. <laughs> and he was like, I never knew that. Um, but it's interesting how I just kind of kept that inside of myself, which is probably the reason why I've also evolved into my musical abilities really late in life, because I'm 39 now, and I really didn't find my voice until I was 30 and didn't okay. release my first album until I was 32. So all these things just like, especially with technology and the internet and how it's forming, kind of the power and the ability to do so is in your hands. So, but yeah, so I, I essentially left that and then I got a, a, a nylon string guitar on my birthday when I was 15. And okay. I was gonna ask actually, piano isn't your, your main instrument anymore, right? Yeah. Guitar. It was, it was I, I ended up finding piano again. Um, okay. Like, uh, it's like the story is pretty vast, but essentially I got in a huge car crash and almost died in 2016. And that's where Spilled Love, my album came from. It was sitting with a doctor and he told me to take on a different instrument so that you, your brain can, um, basically the neurological connections can, be built up past the trauma so that you can come back to yourself. Um, wow. Incredible. So, yeah. So it's, you, like the, the first instrument where that you learned that was traumatic when, when you were a kid actually helped you like build, um, you know, move on from the car crash, from the trauma, from the car crash. Right. Especially. Yeah. And I'm still moving on from that. It's yeah. a, lot, a lot of work, but you know, if you can do the mental, um, disengaging and reconnecting new new wire a new wired brain can create a whole new program in your system that reflects out to what you want to create so um yeah so essentially at 15 i got a guitar and i was raised on a lot of like it's interesting my oldest half brother would play me bands like corn and Limp Biscuit, and I eventually got into like a lot of that heavy core music. Um, and now it's just very challenging for me to listen to 
But on the other spectrum, my father would play me, you know, Beatles, Rolling Stones, yeah. to Paco de Lucia, Omar Liebert, uh, and artists like Jesse Cook eventually. So just listening to that flamenco and that nylon string guitar, I gravitated towards it. And when I got the guitar at 15, it was a nylon string guitar. So I was already in that field of what I was listening to. I can actually play now to some degree, but I, yeah, I never really, I started like learning lessons online on my own, but I mostly okay. naturally was inclined to learn um, just by listening. And like, I think one of the first songs I learned on my own was just Nirvana. <laughs> I just sat down with Come As You Are. And was like, whoa, that's fantastic. So easy, so simple to just sit there and just pluck, put your fingers in place, and all of a sudden you're playing along. So, yeah. Did you find it? Did you find that easy learning by ear? Did that come naturally yeah. to you? Super. It just like I already like in many ways I could just kind of, as I was listening to it, like it's just the idea of when you listen to sound, enter, and. Like even just singing was natural for me. Um, and I was raised in like my background uh, was raised with like religious, like both my parents were Orthodox and I was raised Greek Orthodox and I was raised in uh, Athens, Greece. So listening to all these churches and how they sang uh, their vocal harmonies and how like vast groups would sing in unison and, just repeating that as well kind of brought it into the forefront when I was sitting by myself with, a, you know, cause your voice is your first instrument and then the guitar is your second instrument. So sitting with another voice essentially, but being able to tell the voice what I wanted to do, especially when it's in pain. All right. The artist name makes even more sense now. <laughs> yes, that's right. You get um... it. And so you would like, as a teenager, you just kind of sit in, I'm imagining you like sitting in your bedroom and, and putting like, uh, if you're 39, you were still listening to tapes, right? Or I guess it was the beginning of CDs. Yeah, I was recording uh, tape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you just listen over and over again and, or would you listen and pause and try to figure out the like four notes or, yeah. or just, yeah. Absolutely. Or like, you know, I do it between CD and tape. And yeah. I, I really liked like when Deftones Adrenaline came out, that was like, whoa, what is happening here with all these layers? I can't create this in one nice. sitting. And I'm, that's when I started really learning about like, oh, you actually sit. And I was just fascinated by recording in the first okay. things when I started listening to Deftones out of all things. But yeah, just listening to how things were layered in that sense. Okay. And just how even how Chino Moreno used his voice structure. And yeah, it was just, just something that like really started blowing me away. And so it, yeah, essentially it just moved on from like, all right, now I'm doing it live, but now how do I capture yeah. what I'm also creating? And that didn't really come to like my twenties. Uh, so like five years later, so okay. the timeline progression. I moved pretty quickly, but yeah, one of my first bands was like hardcore um, electronic slash, it was like a Limp Biscuit slash Rage Against the Machine, Slipknot vibes while I was just graduating college in 1998. So, and uh, yeah, I was just like, I mean, one of my first concerts was Corn and Monster Magnet. And then the next day I went to a Yanni concert. And so like, I'm just getting both spectrums of how music is created live. Uh, yeah. Live. And were you already writing your own songs? I didn't really start writing until after um, like entering college. So I'm a Wayne State University alumnus. So like I was writing songs with the heavy metal band and okay. So I guess high school, uh, but I guess I didn't consider writing until I was actually singing or kind of, it was, it was hard for me to determine that because again, I wasn't, I wasn't in primed into realizing that I had my own voice. I was using the yeah. instrument. So yeah, 
it's funny like that just, it just gave me like a little wow but um yeah so essentially i was yeah i was writing at 17 16 just shortly after learning all these songs with deftones and nirvana and you name it Foo fighters was coming filter was great all these interesting layers of music coming yeah into- they really changed um they really changed the I, I i remember when they came out as well they really changed the landscape of you know they they gave themselves permission to mix a lot of different elements that we weren't used to mixing i guess now like you know like um electro classical music and stuff like that it's kind of you know like woodkid or hunt simmer or whatever it's mm-hmm. it's normal to mix different genres of music together but back then it was really really original or at least it felt very original to me um yeah. i mean imagine like i'm listening to that too <laughs> like imagine you're listening to yanni but you're also listening to like limp biscuit yeah and you're, what if these like merged yeah absolutely. <laughs> and i'm i'm actually classically tra- trained but have loved you know have always listened to a lot of jazz uh, but also, you know, I was raised in France and in France, there's a lot, uh, a lot of songs are, are really focused on the storytelling and the lyrics. Um, yeah. So like those three different influences. And also there's a big hip hop scene and like French hip hop scene. So all these influences just, you know, I'm sure you've had, I mean, you'll, you'll tell me, but I know that when I started writing my, I was struggling to know, like I want to write in all those different genres, and I was I I was really struggling, and to some extent I still struggle really to find my unique voice where mm. I combine all of that. Um, did was that something you you faced as well? Like were you trying like were you writing in in more of one genre, or were you writing all all sorts of different things, or did the combination just come really naturally to you? Um. Yeah. Yeah. So like, so when I entered like Wayne State, like, I mean, French music too, I I relate to that because my mother raised me on French music when I was in Greece. And so like, I listened to like, but they were like Greek artists, but living in France, so like Georges mm-hmm. Moustaki and Nana mm-hmm. Moustaki and all these artists that you're like, nobody, nobody even has heard of here in the U.S., but you go across seas and they're like, oh, those are the classics, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, George Musaki is huge and he still is a huge movement in that in the European area. But worldwide he got known pretty well. So but yeah, like I totally just had to kind of relearn. Like when I entered Wayne State University, I didn't really know how to play piano and then all of a sudden you won't graduate unless you take piano courses and i i actually don't know wayne state university where is it is it a music uh it's an actual no it's all all around university um it's like really big with um law it has all different types of curriculum okay you you studied music there yeah it studied i initially went in for music technology but i found loopholes because i was interested in recording so i just was like all right how do i just get a bachelor of arts in music and do everything that i want to with technology but not really learn the electrical engineering side and because i don't want to make pedals uh because i'm not interested in making pedals i'm just interested in how i can create with pedals so to speak um but yeah so you had to learn piano and i also since i really didn't have i tried out for classical guitar and they said i was horrible they actually like told me you are a very slow reader uh because i was just learning how to like sight read yeah. and because i was doing everything by ear so essentially my sight reading like all my stuff that i was doing was i'd just listen to the recordings and then i'd follow along and kind of sight read my way through to some degree and then when they gave me sheet music to start fresh i was like nope um, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's actually I, i'm actually the other way around because i was classically trained like if you give me sheet music i'm fine but mm-hmm. if i need to play by ear then i'm like uh oh this is yeah, so like, <laughs> i guess you know you, you, it's hard to have it all but <laughs> yeah. like your, your training classes were really easy for me yeah but and I also had some type of, like, I tried going into 
percussion when I was in high school. And the teacher was also really horrible to me. So like, I try, like, it's just interesting how I always try to get these right lessons or try to get into like some orchestras. And then after like a semester or two, like it was just the way that I was, um, it, they gave me like a defeatism mentality where like you're just, you're not where you need to be. And I'm like, well, where do I need to be? What do I need to be doing? So yeah, it was just a consistent, like just observing that, like these little, like just spikes and where I could have been creatively um, connected easier, just uh, stunted my uh, evolution and, and evolutionary path in music, so. Actually, I'd like to, um, if it's okay with you, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that because I think in 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 education in general, not just med music education, um, there are a lot of teachers out there who are not, who don't show a lot of empathy or who are maybe like, you know, like the piano teacher you described, I'm sure a lot of people have had that same piano teacher, like the old school, you know, straight and narrow and no other approach, no flexibility whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't know, you know, how horrible he was, but just as a caricature, I, I can definitely, you know, I can definitely relate to, to what you you described earlier and, and what you mentioned about, you know, um, trying percussion and being kind of shut down and same with the sight reading. Um, how did you, how did you manage to like get rid of that kind of, you know, fixed mindset and go into a growth mindset and, and, and back yourself to, you know, to try and to learn and how did you manage that transition? Yeah. Um, poorly. Yeah. I, so I, um, like at first, <clears throat> well, this just kind of kept a spiraling depression throughout my life. So I ended up getting diagnosed with bipolar disorder, which I have my qualms about that type of, um, what that is and that whole book and that what they I give you, that, yeah, the, the identity that they give you behind yeah. it. And, and then eventually saying the doctor saying I was misdiagnosed <laughs> when I was, uh, when I found my voice and when I was actually cohesively speaking and just how I naturally led myself off of the progression of like, I was essentially using, I had used lithium, but all my years from like the age of 18 to about 30, 30 is when it stopped because I had huge um, breaks in my trajectory of life with um, huge traumatic issues that happened where I almost lost my sister. She ended up falling from a seven story building, but uh, she ended up surviving when she did fall. and that three months prior was her trying to assess what the doctors were telling her to do with medications that I've been trying. And those feelings that she was feeling were similar to mine. So as she was mirroring me, I was saying to myself, okay, what's going on with me if I'm feeling these feelings too? And then look at the steps that my sister took that almost led to her death. And where I'm still trying to survive. I'm not even thriving. I'm just trying to survive. And so I basically just took all these. And on top of that, I was really, um, I started like essentially self-medicating with marijuana and I became very addicted to it because it became a coping mechanism because it's essentially what marijuana does is it numbs your prefrontal cortex. So your perception kind of slows down and you can take in the trauma a little bit easier but essentially there's a give and there's a take so I'm binding myself with a chemical instead of binding to my own chemicals right binding mm -hmm. to my own neuroreceptors and I was changing the trajectory of my mind by doing that and on top of that I was also like well how how 
how much lithium, if I've been taking lithium for almost 15 years, how much, how much of it has cloaked my brain as well. So that's when I began the process of like, all right, what's really going on with me? And what's all this stemming to? And where is the inner child that's still crying for help and the sense of shame and abandonment within that it hasn't received? So it led me on this path towards more holistic um, and a holistic approach to like cleansing. So I started really figuring out like saunas and, you know, sweating out your toxins if your skin is your largest nerve uh system that 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 is has seven layers that can be shed every year you know and you can actually do methods to break the chemicals that you wear you know your clothes have chemicals all these things like i used to weigh 250 pounds so as i began this process which was 2010, I started, I started with yoga and like, all right, let me just go and open up my body. And that's where my songs almost started uncovering themselves from within. So like, that's where I started really realizing like this greater part of myself has always been here and to create. And I heard positive love as I'm in like a, you know, one of those uh, downward dog slash, just doing a moon pose and mm -hmm. or warrior pose, I think I was. And I'm like, what is this melody? And it's almost like you think you're going kind of, because I could hear the arrangement so clearly. So I'm looking around saying like, are they playing this over the radio? I, like, because it was a silent moment and there's a lot of, a lot of silent moments. And here's <laughs> like, here's this song where I just went home immediately and just, just, it just came out very naturally. And that's what's been happening with this progression that I've made, this evolutionary path that I've taken within myself, not a change. There's a difference between like change and evolution. A change is like, uh, like you you get, you're given Play-Doh and you're like here molded. Yeah. And then yeah. an evolution is like, totally a totally different trajectory you're you're not even playing with play-doh you're playing with your your own thoughts and your process so yeah mm -hmm. here i am like like that kind of put a spark in me which led me essentially to like now i do what's called energetic development um i tried all these things transcendental meditation didn't even really it was like that secret where they give you a mantra and i'm like yeah. i just told the guy are you kidding me right now with what you're trying to tell me that it's just a mantra and it just reminded me of this biology class that i took i don't know if you ever took this but like where you're sitting you have a frog it's a live frog and you put it into warm water and then you slowly turn it up to boiling so that you can kill it and then dissect it um, so we did this in class and it was reminding me of that. Like here I am meditating on a mantra and I'm like a frog in warm water going to boiling and I still can't get out of, I don't see any way out of my, the thought that I'm really considered. And sure. It feels good for a second, but in the end, what did it do for me? It just made me sit with the thought and made me, it made me really challenge how to take the action because of how much was already, how much shame I was already sitting in. As much as I could look at it, I still felt stuck in it. Like neurologically, like yeah, I get that. And, and I think I think different things work for different people because, yeah. um, for example, like I, I went to I went through um, something similar with my brother, and in and, and to to cope with that, I uh, I actually took an online course that uh, related to music. It's called uh, Start Now. Mm -hmm. uh, finish fast I think it's by a guy um, his kind of artist name is Mike Monday anyway the course was about music and just finishing music but the first thing it was across like six module and the first thing he got us to do was meditate try meditation mm -hmm. and like I wasn't big on meditation but he had this quote from I think it's Jonathan Hyde, Hyde or 
it might be another guy, but the quote was, I'm paraphrasing, but was basically, okay, if I told you there was something that you could do um, that was free and would, you know, make you feel more relaxed, would you try it? And then if I told you that it's risk-free, you know, it's not a drug, it's risk-free, um, you cannot have any, you know, uh, negative side effect, would you try it? And it was just a bunch of things where you're like, okay, I can try it, you know, you just kind of, um, you know, putting aside all those mental barriers of, I don't even want to try meditation's not for me, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I started meditating with like headspace, you know, just a simple app and that. it's really changed my life for the better, but I've tried yoga and yoga does not do the same thing for me. For me, it's, um, you mentioned for transcendental, um, meditation that you feel like you're sitting the, with the, thought and it's actually counterproductive mm -hmm. and I felt similarly with yoga um like I went through a you know a breakup and just standard life stuff and I was lying there on the mat and just you know didn't get the thought out of my mm -hmm. so you know different stuff works for different people like I I'm a, I do a lot of sports like a physical exercise so I think the type of yoga I chose was probably not the right fit for me where mm -hmm. a more active or dynamic type of yoga would, would might have worked better for me. Like, um, well, you know, at some point, yes, I have a you. friend, she refuses to sit down and meditate, but she's a triathlete. Uh -huh. And I think it's just her form of meditation, you know, just so yeah, like a, a form of sport. I don't, I don't like, I really don't connect with the word meditation anymore. I, I look at it more as an internal focus work. Um, yeah. There's a meditative quality to it. But yeah. even I even tried Headspace and it didn't. Um, ev eventually, it felt like I was creating an, an ad another addiction yeah. toward sitting with something as opposed to just being with me. Like you know, you have a you have, absolutely you, yeah. you come into connection with somebody that is guiding you towards something. But essentially, you want it to be used as a tool so that you can do it yourself. You sure. know? Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's it kind of becomes like a sport, and it's not really meant to. <laughs> I mean, it it's meant to just sit to remind you of what you are and who you are in general, which you're more than what you perceive. You know, sure. something I like to do as well. Um, do um, I'm almost sure you do it as well, but I'm curious to find out. Do you journal a lot? Yeah, I use a day one journal, okay. which is like uh, kind of like Evernote. Um, but I also have like, uh, I'm getting back into doing it physically because there's something about just writing something yeah. down and crossing it off when you're finished with it that really feels like you accomplished something, even though you think you didn't do much in a day. And then all of a sudden you look at your like checklist sheet of what you did, whether it's like writing a detailed message to somebody or, you know, taking the time to like just analyze for me right now it's a lot of mixing mastering notes mm -hmm. so like i have all these things that i've written down or these classes and courses that i'm beginning to offer and writing down the curriculum mm -hmm. like i feel like it didn't accomplish anything for a moment but then when i realized what i did and i wrote it down it makes a huge difference yeah yeah absolutely. i'm a big advocate of pen and paper it's um it's just a different medium and it changes the way um, you approach things and I mean, obviously both have their strength, but I, I really love pen and paper. Well, it's um, a big deal towards your, like towards connecting your fingers, right? Yeah. Cause we don't, uh, like, I, I don't know if you've seen that, that there's like a crazy epidemic happening to children now where they, um, they're, it's called dysgraphia. So they're losing sensing of connecting their fingers. Really? Um, because they're touching iPhones, so they're just doing touch yeah. instead of grappling, you know, just grappling, yeah. grabbing things. So it's starting to like evolve, how the, you know, because we're adaptogenic beings, so it's evolving the body in a weird way. Yeah. All right. Um, let's go back to the music. So, like, about nine years ago, when you were on 30, you started finding your voice you had this trauma with your um with your sister and 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 was kind of i guess the trigger to find your own voice um yoga helped with that at the time like 
you had finished, you were out of university. Did you have a full-time job or were you kind of drifting a little bit yeah. or? I was actually working on my, I was working on another degree in nursing. So I was going to become okay. a nurse and I just got a phlebotomy certificate and I was already working in the hospital. So I was working in the hospital and I was getting my phlebotomy training, but the Starbucks in the hospital that I, uh, was going to actually paid more than what the phlebotomist was getting. And I was like, <laughs> this is dumb. So I applied for a Starbucks position in the hospital. And then, yeah, eventually with all that, like when my sister ended up, like that whole happenstance with the, the trauma that occurred, I was like, I don't even want to be in the hospital. Like I'm already, like the empathy that I have towards people and how they're experiencing life. And here I am seeing a ton of people on their deathbeds, like walking into MRSA rooms and people that have like a skin eating disease on them and treating, taking their blood at 4 a.m. in the morning was not something I uh, thought, felt that I could continue experiencing for the rest of my life. Um, yeah. and, uh, granted, I have a lot of empathy for people that do go do that because it is absolutely phew, you know, you have to like almost put on your shield and just walk in and say, okay, this is the human condition right now. I, but yeah, eventually I found myself and like, I left and found this really awesome new startup business called Commonwealth. It was a coffee shop that now you know, that served like organic food. And as eventually I, I found a mentor in there, like the boss who was an entrepreneur, um, saw that I was having a lot of mental difficulties. And even though I was um, getting like around $10 an hour plus, like it was, the tips were really great because the location was in a place called Birmingham, Michigan, which is like, uh, I don't know if you know Birmingham or Oakland County, but it's like considered one of the richest okay. areas. And so you'd have these, like I'd be speaking with, like really high <laughs> technical uh, people. And there were a lot of like um, online um, companies and advertising agencies around there. So that actually was like <laughs> interesting how it's called Commonwealth. It was like the building, the seed that let me like naturally talk about me coming into my voice. And that's when I also just started reaching out and doing YouTube covers and trying things and then getting like that little family of Commonwealth would respond to the, the videos that I was making. And then I was also like kind of just testing the waters, jumping on like, all right, what can I cover a song the day it's released? And that's what I did with like an Adele song. And it was really challenging because at the same time, like, like if I go back and watch it, I'm like, man, that's not like I'm trying to emulate Adele's voice with my falsetto. And it was also the time where like Bon Iver came out with his falsetto and oh, so yeah. artists with the like the falsetto. Granted, that was really like Tom York is the one that really made me say like, hey, <laughs> I know I can hone in on my falsetto because I have that I have that within myself but I'm not Tom York and I'm not Justin Vernon and I'm not Adele. And, but here I am trying something, yeah. you know, I'm looking to, I'm almost like I'm searching. I was actually waiting for people to just be like, this is horrible. I wanted almost to see like what that reaction would be because, you know, in many ways in this human created technology field of YouTube, people thrive on that negativity. And then all that does is boost the video. So that's what I was, my mentality was like, fine, I'm just going to do it and wait for like the really? next to just like, oh, that's and, interesting. And in many ways it did, it boosted those videos to some degree because um, not only was I riding the wave of the song coming out, like it was Adele, she released Skyfall. And then mm -hmm. I was like, all right, can I learn this song in a day and then release it? And I did. And then it like jumped up to like, I think 11,000 views within a couple of days. And just doing stuff like that was like intriguing for me. 
which also helped bump my original music when it was first coming out. But how much of that turnover was actually genuine to genuine people subscribing to finding my own music? Almost like less, you know, it's basically what a Spotify listen equates to, like 0.04% were yeah. really uh, actually genuinely engaged. You know, they just were engaged. I think that's really interesting. You mentioned that um, with with creative and productive dot com and and actually with my licensing course, um, a lot of people ask me about social media, and a lot of my friends say, "Oh, you should be more on social media for you know to build my audience for creative and productive." And I'm not I'm not I don't spend a lot of time on social media, and my reasoning is like, well, you know, the people I want on my website, I want them to read long form content that mm -hmm. is high quality and in depth and that will help them if they apply it. So the, if I spend a, a bunch of time trying to get them from social media to read the website, the people that are on social media are, are that spend a lot of time on social media are probably not the best fit for me. Mm -hmm. And, and I think it's interesting that you notice that, you know, the people who were watching your videos because it was released the next day, you know, from, from, from the originals release, like you manage to get, to get huge volumes, but huge volume, but huge volume doesn't necessarily equate to, you know, to huge long-term engagement. And I think it's really, really important to, to keep that in mind. Like the, mm -hmm. the two songwriters I know, um, that make the most money that I know personally, um, they have almost no online presence whatsoever because yeah. they're busy, you know, actually yeah. making music and talking to super famous um, filmmakers, you know. So, um, so I, I think it's really cool that you did that because I'm sure you learned a bunch. Oh, and yeah. I think it's... step back a little bit. Sorry? It made me step back a little bit and say, what do I even want to create here? Um, yeah. And that's but also I, having that deadline, you know, can I learn that song in one day? That's yeah. got to make you a better songwriter in the long run. For sure. It's a great exercise. I'll tell you that yeah. much. And I'd be willing to try it again. Um, but on my terms with what I want to learn, you know, yeah. like find an old song that I really like. Like right now I'm looking at a lot of Cat Stevens again. So I'm like, I really like the wind. Maybe, you know, Maybe I can make it my own and just release it for what it is and say, okay, I'm giving myself a goal of, you know, three days to finish it with yeah. all this stuff. And now I'm like, I'm taking now, since we have the creative power and all these sites, you know, like I'm, I engaged in sound drop just recently because okay. a friend approached me that made a very lucrative income from doing songs that are two songs in one so like they're mashups yeah. so they ended up doing a mashup uh the band is called less is more and they did a mashup with another band that ended up getting on a spotify playlist that got 60 million something hits and so yeah. you have to split that four ways but 60 million hits equates to or roughly around a hundred thousand dollars for each artist you know really yeah, it's quite a bit. So, as, but of course, oh, yeah, the 60, I was thinking six. Yeah. yeah 60 million. Yeah. So, so yeah. the fact that that happened, they were like, we want to try to help you. We believe in what you're creating. And so I ended up revisiting that song called Heartbeats and released it as an actual, you know, cohesive recording as opposed yeah. to just something I did live on YouTube. So I revisited and I'm working with a lot of sample libraries now that I really enjoy like Spitfire is doing amazing things. And so now here it comes into the, the prime where you can create cohesively um, beautiful works and that's what they did. And so we, they ended up liking the heartbeat song so much that they were like, you should just release it on your own. And, we're gonna. They, we did a mashup with like Bonnie Bear. Um, they did like a. Their, it was their wedding song. The couple's called Finkel slash Less Is More. But um, so they did that, and then we mashed it together, and 
they're now trying to work with their company in LA that's pitching it to different, uh, you know. That's really cool. And I've got, a, I've got a couple of questions around that actually. Um, the f I'll, I'll, I'll uh, state both questions and you decide which order you wanna, you wanna go in. Cause um, I feel like we skipped the part about your residence and the sync licensing. So we might want to go back to that. Sure, uh, yeah. But before maybe, uh, how did you meet those people, the, the artists you were, um, the less is more, like how did you get that opportunity? Um, I played a live show with them um, at, in Lansing at a place called Max Bar. Okay. I just, I just opened up for uh, a bigger artist, uh, an artist from Canada named Ben Kaplan. And they were the, they were local to Lansing, so they were trying to find an artist that was in that similar vein. And since I'm in the Detroit area, I just took an hour trek with, um, and I hired some session musicians. And and do you do you find you meet like when you're building like your music network? Do you find that most people you meet are through are when you're doing live shows, or do you meet a lot of people online as well, or do you meet a lot of people at other events like you mentioned at, um, oh, at that commonwealth job you met a lot of people like creators from ad agencies uh -huh. is that like do you have a whole bunch of different ways that you connect with people or is there one way that's easier for you yeah that, that is, that's absolutely how it is and that's why um like i know you, you mentioned you want people to read like long form yeah. but like here i was wrestling with the idea of, like what do i do instagram what I, you know, all these mediums, what do I need? What do I, and it's more so like, okay, well, Instagram is kind of like my picture book. So you get like a moment of my life. Yeah. I don't care about the little hearts, whatever. And I also give myself, you can give yourself timers now. So I give myself a 10 minute timer on Instagram wow. and I only go like when that, when that 10 minute timer runs out, I don't look at Instagram the rest of the day. No matter what, if you're sending me a bunch of messages to respond, emails where I go. So that's that's where the content hub is for yeah. me, for everybody. It's email. So, you know, like same, like Twitter, I hardly, like I use here. But when I have like, if I had like that huge campaign with Pure Michigan. So, and when I have like bigger campaigns, like I was, I, I was part of like some, uh, creative political campaigns okay. um, over the summer last year. And so they used Twitter um, to use, that was the platform that really resonated. And that was a company called Means Media. And yeah, so like, it's just that, that idea of like, all right, where, who am I connecting with? And I noticed more and more that Detroit and Assemble Sound uh, really like, eclipse that hub for me because here are all these creatives that are coming in yep. and it began the process for me to collaborate on even with electronic artists that I didn't even think my voice could fit in electronic songs and all of a sudden here it is um, with people that really have focused on creating that genre which I'm kind of learning but I'm still like beginner so it's more so like you also sit in the room with them and you're watching how they're choosing their sounds. And that's how I learned about like splice and sample libraries and creating yeah. your own sample libraries and how the power of the tool in front of you and knowledge really does eclipse all that. So if you don't have the knowledge, then you can't, you don't even know what you're searching for. So, but yeah, like, it's just kind of choose your tools wisely and how long you want to work with the tool that you're using. You know, you have 24 hours yeah, in your for sure. for sure. And I mean, I don't mean to, to this social media cause it's obviously extremely powerful and Absolutely. a lot of people use it very efficiently as well in terms of promotion. Mm -hmm. um, it's just like, I don't, and I don't have any interest in learning that side of that side of things. Um, mm -hmm. But for sure, there are a lot of people that use social media in a super creative way and, and that can convert to, um, you know, to, to real 
connected and engaged audience, which is what you know, what, what we all want to genuine <laughs> to genuine um, relationships. But it sounds to me like you found in your case as well that like face to face, like tends oh. to like ten x or hundred x. Really, the the like right now I'm focusing on like a lot of people are like, oh, CDs are going out, but you go to concerts and people are asking you like, where's your CD? Yeah. They're like they want something to hold. And I learned about that when like my album, all my music right now is more popular in Japan. Crazy. Wow. But the reason that it got popular was because of social media. Yeah. It was like, like one of my, my song was actually, a, it was a French song. It's called Chance. And it's nice. me. It's like an ode to my mother. And but basically, they took the instrumental and they used a visual supply company, VSCO, had all these little do mini documentaries that they were doing with focused on artists that use their, their platform and um, use their application. And then he also has a huge following on Instagram, I think almost a million followers. Wow. So the photographer is... The whole video is in Japanese and it's got subtitles and here he is photographing his kids, explaining his life. It's, it's an artist named Hideki Hamada um, and it's called the, the Wonder of Childhood or something like that. And all of a sudden, this random company called Designate Records in Japan is like, we love your music. And it's all like, can't understand, like it's disjointed because they're obviously taking what they're saying and then they're translating it from Japanese to English. So it's just, it's fun to read. Very yeah. interesting. And you're like, what is this? Is this spam? And they're like, we'd love to license your song. And I'm like, okay, which one do you want to license? And they're like, all of them. And I'm like, all right, uh, what do you want to license them to? Like a video? What do you want to do? And they're like, no, CD. And so they took, they basically, you know, we worked a contract out where, I still wanted all, um, since Spotify was just coming into play yeah. and uh, iTunes and all this streaming stuff was still coming into play. I still wanted all. Uh, when free. was that? Sorry. This was like 2013, 2014. Okay. okay. The, the, I negotiated a contract where they gave me like two grand up front. And then as well as like, I shipped them like almost 500 vinyl wholesale. And like, uh, and they gave me 2000 on top of that. And then I also had like 18% of any CD sales that they made when they replicated the um, Positive Love CD. And okay. then I, I had 100% of streaming royalties and all the back end. So like that was a negotiated contract that first wanted like a part of it. And I was like, no, I think I see what's happening here. And I, I, I essentially want to own my masters on the back end. So either you play or not, you know? So it was almost a record deal, I guess. Yeah. It, was a record deal. it is. It's called Desine Records. Oh yeah. But they, yeah. and you mentioned, um, they're trying to figure out like a 10 day tour for me over there. They're still trying to figure out something over there. Nice. For me. Um, but then I, I started releasing all these new videos where I did a time lapse video of, me shaving my head and beard and i saw that one it's, it's awesome kind of like really process it. of what's going on with me right now yeah but um and i don't know a couple of follow-up questions on that um I, they always seem to come in two uh, so, um how did you negotiate the contract like were you used to doing that do you have a lawyer that you use do you yeah i actually used uh he was he was eminem's lawyer at one point kid rock's lawyer his name is howard hertz oh uh, yeah you're in detroit that's right yeah so i i basically just went to the top and i was like i'm not gonna mess this up it's really expensive it basically costs as much. I basically took the investment that I received from the record label on the front end and just put it into a lawyer contract. Okay. And so this is what I really want. And, and then now I have that knowledge, so I don't really have to go to him. Yeah. Um, but you I've know acquired, it's solid. You know? Yeah. I've acquired what a solid contract looks like. 
yeah. and so that I can use for the rest of my life, so to speak, and show yeah. others what a solid contract looks like as opposed to one that I might not be so solid, you know? Yeah. And the other question I, I wanted to clarify, so you mentioned it was an artist who used your instrumental in one of their Instagram posts? It was a company, visual supply company, VSC. Yeah. They, so I got paid for that license. Um, like Mar through a library or did they come to, uh, yeah, through a library? I'm an artist with Marmoset. I got there early. Okay, awesome. So, yeah, let's go back to that. So like the reason what, how I got into Marmoset was okay. because Marmoset was visiting Detroit and they walked into an advertising agency in Birmingham with Pluto who had my vinyl playing in the background and they said, we love this music. We need to put it in our catalog. And then they contacted me and that's how that happened. That is awesome. And so <laughs> like, how did your vinyl end up there? Like playing in so the background? Greater story. So <laughs> like my We're just friend, gonna Tarantino this, okay? <laughs> so my friend Ian Sigman, who worked for Pluto at the, at the time, who now has his own company called Gunner. Uh, he helped me produce, he kind of kicked my ass into creating this album. So he, we met at a Halloween party two years prior to me working at Commonwealth. And he loved my, he loved my- oh, uh, Sorry, that was around 2008 then? Or? Yeah, or no, 2010. Uh, okay. No, 2008, you're right, in 2008. So we met at um, a Halloween party I was actually hitting on his girlfriend, now wife. And, <laughs> but he loved my, um, my charisma so much that he was like, I need to take a picture with you. And it was a Polaroid. And so his uh, wife, Nicole, took a picture. And that's all that was. Of, I never got his number, nothing. And yeah. just, I, I didn't even remember his name. And... Two years later, here I am working at Commonwealth as a barista, just explaining that I'm into music. And he just walks in and we just both give each other a look like I've, I've seen you before. I just don't know where. And he even tells me like I've seen you before and I'm trying to remember. And then like a week later, he comes in and he gives me the picture and he's like, that's where I see you from. That is so awesome. Why? And so he's working and Pluto and he and here I am making these YouTube videos and then he heard a Bon Iver cover and it was like I love your falsetto do you have any originals because I wasn't posting yet and I was like yeah I have a lot and then he came over and like listened to music and started getting frustrated with me because he's like why haven't you released any of this and I'm like I don't know I'm just trying to figure out what to do with all this because that's when I was trying to figure out licensing at the same time Okay. And also, so you had of, licensing in mind. You, you I had licensing that. in mind because I started realizing that, like, oh, you know, like, how is it? How are all these artists that are popular, that are great singer songwriters, getting found? You know, a lot of the early artists, like, I think, like Matt Kearney. Um, you know, he was on these TV shows that had like huge. You know, they played at the end of us, like, I think Sia, you know, she was the huge catalyst for that, where she had one of her songs at that six feet under the yeah. end. Yeah. Yeah. They played her whole song. You know, much, I mean, her, the fact that she's on that for the life of that show, you know, I don't know what that back end contract looks like, but I know it's definitely earned her uh, yeah. lifetime. That's, that's lifetime. Um, income so and sorry i just want to interrupt like 15 seconds because a lot of people ask me regularly is it a bad idea to have my song on spotify if i want to pursue licensing opportunities and the answer to that is no it's not a bad idea you know you want your music to be out there otherwise right. nobody is going to have the idea you know nobody's going to hear it and nobody will want to license it but so that was just as many mediums as possible like get it on soundcloud you'd be yeah. surprised like look i mean rick rubin found dram on SoundCloud when he had 300 followers. Wake up. Did that, not know. Yeah, that is like, there are creative searching, you know, that are like, I just, you know, <laughs> things are becoming more like a diamond in the rough. Like where are the, where are the golden nuggets that I really want to listen to? And 
that I want to actually make glow um, in this weird field that, that I can't touch, right? So yes. that's what it really comes down to. And how, where is your greater sense of responsibility to make that happen for yourself? You know? Yeah, I think it's, a, it's definitely a huge mistake when you're trying to hide your music or protect it from yeah. imaginary so evil. Um, Just put yeah, it out. You know, that comes from internal shame. Yeah. For sure. It's, it's like there's some abandonment. There's definitely some trauma that's related to that because you feel you're not good enough or you feel like it's not worthy enough. Or, there's a lot of things that can come into play with that for sure. And I had that sense as well, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so the vinyl is playing in the background of your friend's company uh, and Marmoset visit and they, they want it. So th like... You were saying that happened in 2013, 2014? Well, 2000, uh, so like I met Ian in 2008, 2010, I was working in yeah. Commonwealth. Uh, he helped kick my ass. Like I, yeah. I did a Kickstarter for Positive Love. So I, I raised over five grand um, using Amanda Palmer's strategy of offering the album for a dollar. And then that ended up getting strangers to like um, download and just they're like i don't i don't know what you're creating but like when i started listening like what the song sounded like then i tried reddit i tried all these different social media strategies to like get people to even try to watch the kickstarter video did you use amanda palmer's book or did you have a roadmap or were you just trying a bunch of different things i was just reverse engineering what amanda palmer's kickstarter just was because i okay. went like it was that kickstarter where she first raised yeah largest amount which was over a million dollars yeah and that was her like i was like okay well look at what her strategies are she's offering the album for a dollar look at okay. all the, look at all her you know tears and how she's offering look how she's doing updates granted i'm not at the magnitude or the mass of followers because i only had 300 people that were following me on facebook but if i did the tears right and i only got like almost 200 people to support me is what happened wow. and some you know they were random and a lot of this i started learning from uh, a company called groovebox studios which initially like i didn't do positive love first i did a live version of a couple songs from positive love so i did like an ep and started learning kickstarter and just crowdfunding in general through a company called Groovebox Studios, which is now Woodshed Agency, which teaches you okay. how to campaign roadmaps. And okay. cool. yeah, so like a lot of that stuff, I was just like, well, I need to begin to treat this like I am an entity, you know, this is my business identity. Yeah. So to speak, and be okay with that. Like, like I'm okay with walking into Commonwealth and serving coffee. Well, then I'm okay with showing people that my music is also worth like a cup of coffee to some degree, you know, yeah. or it's, it's I always say it's better than gum, you know, <laughs> just is, you know, so yeah, that's the idea. Okay. And so um, you mentioned you were already aware of licensing before the Marmoset thing happened. So there's a lot of luck involved in the Marmoset thing. Obviously the music is great because, you know, that's like, I don't, even look, I don't look at luck. I look at like, I look at opportunity and happenstance. And yeah, the for sure. Yeah. It's you're, you're hundred percent. Right. It's just, I'm anticipating people saying like, Oh, well, you know, he just got lucky and no, you did I, get I, lucky. You know, you, you I, made I, music. I, yeah. But I, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity that I could have put on the table that I didn't actually do if I didn't even, you know, if those dots, if I didn't connect the dots to YouTube, look at all the dots that I pre-connected to get to that. Like yeah. I took all this, um, just a bunch, like look at all the action, the persistent action that I took that led me to creating an album that was on vinyl, right? This is on vinyl that they're listening to. So I had a vinyl created, right? That's like, luck doesn't even make sense in that aspect because there was so many steps towards action yeah. that led me to that, that yeah. opportunity. So. 
And that's why I was asking as well about the Kickstarter campaign. Um, you know, the idea of just trying a lot of different things, just like, yeah, on I mean, YouTube, you know, you try the cover songs. You've obviously before, before my reset ever even happened, you did a bunch of things that, that led you there. And I love that um, you mentioned connecting started. dots, you know, um, I don't know if you're referring, if you think of Steve Jobs address um, when you mentioned connecting the dots, I can't remember where it was. He has an address where, um, he mentions that it's all about connecting the dots, that everything you do just makes sense, but later. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, later. No, I, I, maybe it's like... I'll I, send you a link I, afterwards. It's, uh, yeah. I'm not a huge Steve Jobs fan, but, um, mm-hmm. but I really like, Thanks, I like that philosophy, the, the, that idea. Um, yeah, he, he had a pretty, I mean... Uh, yeah, we can talk about Steve Jobs. I'll tell you, I just feel he had a deep sense of abandonment and the fact that yeah. he created a tool like the iPhone kind of goes to show you that he wanted a deep sense of control. And instead of using what he created as a tool, he used it as a form of control. So yeah. my thoughts on Steve Jobs. But he had a right premise of connecting the dots to get to a control. But um, yeah, I, I the connecting dots is like, I hear Amanda Palmer talk about too, like she has a certain ethic towards that, but okay, it's an analogy. That's, it's a beautiful analogy. I mean, we are, you know, to start connecting your neurological dots, then actually start getting, you know, your eyes go right to your brain. It's the only thing that can see outside the pixelations, the little dots. So we are all looking at tiny little pixelations of a reality that eventually turns into something that is an illusion. <laughs> yeah. So, so. I know. Um, yeah. So sorry, I, I, I interrupted you several times, but um, so before the Marmoset thing, you knew about licensing where you, did you already have your music in other music libraries or were you already submitting music or no, what I, you towards that? Yeah. Marmoset was like the spark for okay. sure. And okay. And then Assemble Sound kind of came a little bit later. And that was also when I was starting to find, like, uh, there was a site called How to License Your Music Premium.com. Yeah. Uh, named by uh, Aaron Davidson. He's, yes. he's really, he's con- very concrete. I highly suggest, like, yeah. that just gave me a very clear uh, understanding of what licensing looks like. And, um, yeah, that, that was also a really big eye-opener for me. And... There were a couple other sites I tried, but they didn't really hit. It's like you're just trying to find the, the teachers that like will teach you in a way that makes sense to you. So that's that's where I'm even coming in with. Maybe I can create courses as well that can give people more of a concrete, you know, path towards understanding all this as well. Like we are all teachers, so. Sure. And you know that that's I mentioned long form content that gives you practical. Uh, advice earlier that's the same idea and yeah yeah, so with Aaron's content so like the assemble um, assemble sound um, opportunity was it like through Aaron's um, like licensing challenge with the leads he sent to you like did you submit music to a bunch of of different did and I found more so like all right most of these are like either pay to play and then I couldn't really do those because I was with Marmoset yeah and so then I started learning about like what the value of my music really is worth and Marmoset was beginning to show me that and then shortly like Assemble Sound also works uh, in the same vein but they're since they're not crossing paths with Marmoset I was able to be on both okay and and so, but, you know, I look at that whole non-exclusive thing as kind of like it's semi-exclusive to some degree because now with technology, you can't retitle stuff because that's what non-exclusive companies tend to do. They retitle yeah. things. And then all of a sudden you're like, which PRO pays who, what, things get, can get jumbled. So I definitely am focusing now on like s- splitting catalogs or like yeah, offering okay. for one working with non-exclusive and now even focusing more on exclusive libraries 
that only are, are more boutique. So they have a small amount of artists and they're looking like they'll send you certain videos that yeah. don't have music on them and say, hey, you know, turnaround time is always 24 to 48 hours. And I'm like, why are you doing this to everybody? <laughs> but, um, you know, that's, that's the way that the, the music business is like, that's the weird way that it works for some reason. It's like, got to have it now. And so um, did all those companies find you? Assemble Sound, yep, they found me too because they were just starting and they were looking for artists in the Detroit area okay. that were already like pretty established and then to try to see how they can collaborate with artists. So they're looking for like, well, like artists that are already creating in the, in the field and how they're... You know how they found you? Well, I knew like, I knew Jax Anderson who, um, she used to go by Flint Eastwood now she goes by Jax Anderson. She like came into her name, and uh, Seth Anderson. They were uh, really great uh, supporters of my craft. And, and how did you meet them? So I met them through another like little mini party in Detroit. You know, yeah. it's like um, one you know one little connection leads to a possible other one. It's like you know. I think Woody Allen says you meet 80% 80, 80 of the people. It's like just meet, you know, you just have to go out there and just go out. I don't know. You don't stay in all the time. You have to just be present in areas, even if you're not going to say much, you know. But, yeah, it's just kind of showing up. You just show up and see what happens. And, and, and if be you... Present. I think that's... Yeah. That's key. Yeah, and if, and if you don't... um yeah if you don't even take that action like what's what's causing you not to take that action like maybe you need to go a little deeper maybe you need to restructure yourself so yeah that's how that happens oh. and then yeah they eventually when garrett was starting to form assemble sound they we just had like a meeting in anthology coffee and the, and nicole churchill um who's the music supervisor she I kind of already knew her through my friend Jeff Dittenberg, who was my mixing mastering engineer for my debut record. Um, and yeah, so it's just like, all right, well, I have some sort of already established trust with people that I've already took action to connect with. So. Yeah. Um. I actually have a bunch of, you know, I, I could go on for hours, <laughs> uh, but I also want to be respectful of your time and I'm sure my energy levels are going to drop soon because sure. um, it's dinner time in France. Oh, but, yeah. Over here, I got, I got another meeting with a, a great, yeah, I got like a meeting with the, uh, the person that helps manage Jax Anderson in about 20 minutes. So I get it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we've covered a, a lot of ground and I think your, your journey is, is incredibly rich and, um, and I love that we were able to go a little bit deeper on the, on, like on who we are and why we do things and why we don't do things. Um, is there like, now in, in, in 2019 and considering, you know, the, the, the trauma you've experienced, um, um, the, um, you know, the, the challenges you faced, is there something that you know now that you didn't know um, before that you think is, is key in what's helped you achieve what you have achieved so far? Yeah, I wish I had, instead of just living by myself and doing this, <laughs> Uh, path. I wish I had other people around me that were trying to experience that idea. And that's what I'm forming right now, which is something called the Greater Impact House. And so I'm really like doubling down on the efforts of making uh, a revival, a small revival in the city within myself. Uh, so taking that action again where people are like you got heart but i don't know how this is gonna happen like that's how 
it's just interesting how like if you want something to you know evolve you have to kind of show people that it's possible when they think it's impossible so but yeah i, I basically just bought a house that's three miles down from assemble sound and uh right down the street from motown museum um and yeah essentially that road that i'm on just got paved today <laughs> so and there's only about four streets on that property that are actually livable or four houses on that property that are actually livable and the there's a lot of blight that's starting to be removed so um the property next to mine is going to be removed uh, it's set for demolition and then i can acquire that for five hundred dollars um mm -hmm. And the property that I purchased was with music licensing funds that I received from Facebook campaigns, actually internal Facebook campaigns that um, gave me, I think they gave me almost six grand for wow. this. Face. These were non-exclusive licenses. And I turned that around and decided to purchase a house off of auction in Detroit for five grand. And put a thousand dollars worth of work into it so far with replumbing but here's the strategy you know and really beginning to document a journey that will eventually create a space a hub for creatives to come in to experience something that can alter the evolutionary path of where they want to go and so i'm really hunkering down on the idea of taking away substances that alter your perceptions with like marijuana vaping now i heard is going to actually become illegal in michigan for a little bit um because a child ended up dying in illinois which i don't know a really in-depth story but all these like alcohol these these are big vices uh, addictive vices that can alter your perception of creativity um, and the people I've always used it, you can hear it in songs, you can hear it and mm. like, you can just hear it kind of almost altering the frequency and changing your perceptive path towards what you want to be creating. So maybe if you begin to offer an artist a place where that's not going to serve uh, the purpose of their creations, um, then maybe you can begin to create something new. That's an incredible project. And if there's, um, you know, any way I can help down the line, don't hesitate to reach out. I'd, I'd love to do, you know, to contribute in any way I can. For sure. Uh, the whole um, crowdfunding campaign and everything yeah. is responsible. So like my next album is going to, is essentially going to be the catalyst for creating the funds to, get this house in order before it goes to like, I'm also learning how to make it a not for profit. So before it even becomes that I'm trying to, I'm trying to show people my best uh, work that I've worked. This album is eight years in the making with a bunch of different orchestral arrangements and professional violinists and cellists and bassists and arrangements that I feel will make your heart love you more <laughs> so i i can't wait to hear it and i'll i'll definitely um you know i'll definitely be by your side if uh if you need me thank you thanks joyce thanks so much for your time and you know just keep keep going your music is awesome i really love it and i'm uh, incredibly excited for you know both your music projects your licensing projects your course projects and mm -hmm. your um you know the community of musicians that that are able to sit with themselves and create uh, <laughs> instead of consuming i'm um, mm -hmm. really excited for about all your projects so um all the best to you and uh, hopefully we talk soon again yeah, let's get you to Detroit. Yes, I would love to. I love Eminem. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, don't know the guy. All right. All right, cool. Bye. Bye. Pleasure.